Welcome back to our CNN election special. The final five, the final five candidates still in contention for the nation's highest office. Texas Senator Ted Cruz is with me right now. Senator, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Wolf. Are you've attacked Donald Trump in your AIPAC speech. You went after him, suggesting he's not pro-Israel enough, that he's against the Iran, that he's not necessarily against the Iran deal. Uh, what do you back any of that up? Because I listened to his speech very carefully. He was against the Iran deal, very pro-Israel. What do you say? Well, you know, it's interesting. You can listen to Donald Trump on any given day, and he can give you three different answers in the course of the day. Uh, did you listen to his speech? Uh, I listened to part of his speech. What did you think? Uh, look, I, I think his speech was actually an improvement. He clearly hired someone to write that speech for him, and, and, and he said some good things. Now, they were different from what he said in the course of the campaign. Uh, what and, was different? Well, for example, he said two debates ago uh, that if he were president, he would be, quote, neutral between Israel and the Palestinians. And trying to negotiate a deal. Yes, and, and, and I think that gets it exactly wrong. What, what that suggests is, is that he buys into the moral equivalency that many in the media p pitch. And I, I think if you don't know the difference between your friends and enemies, if you think that the state of Israel that is defending itself against terrorism is somehow morally equivalent to terrorists who are murdering Americans, murdering Israelis, who are strapping dynamite he, to their chest. But he was not neutral in that speech today. Well, he didn't say that, but that's, you know, Donald is, is an interesting fellow because he can say totally different policy positions in the course of a day from one end to the other. But on, on, with respect to the Iran deal, also in the debates, he said no, he would not rip up the Iranian nuclear deal. Instead, and this is his answer to everything, he would renegotiate it. He would get a better deal. Anyone who says that doesn't understand the Ayatollah Khamenei. Uh, let's talk about the a peace negotiation in the Middle East. You've repeatedly criticized Trump, suggesting there's no difference between him and Hillary Clinton, that they both say they want to negotiate a peace deal. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with negotiating a peace deal? Well, look, nothing's wrong with negotiating a peace deal if the Palestinians will come and seek peace. The barrier to peace is not Israel. Israel wants peace, has wanted peace every day of its existence, the barrier is the Palestinians. So what do the Palestinians need to do, from your perspective, in order for you as president to negotiate a peace agreement? Look, in order for there to be a peace agreement, the Palestinians need to acknowledge Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state, they've, which they they've deny. Acknowledged Not as a Jewish Palestinian state, they don't. Palestinian Authority has acknowledged the two-state solution, Israel and Palestine. But they do not acknowledge Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. And the Palestinian Authority is in a so-called unity government with Hamas, a terrorist organization the PA celebrates when terrorists murder innocent people. Taylor Force, an American, a Texan, who was just recently murdered by a Palestinian terrorist, the PA celebrates that and they compensate the families of the terrorist for murdering innocent so Americans the, if and Israelis. the Palestinians Israel. say they accept Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state... And they have you, to renounce terrorism. They have they to stop inciting terrorism. terrorism, stop paying the families of Then you'll try to broker a deal? Look, I'm happy to tr try to broker a deal from the beginning. But the difference is you need a president who stands with Israel, who doesn't accept this moral equivalence that the Palestinians are somehow the same as the Israelis when the PA is celebrating terrorists murdering women and children. It's not a moral equivalence. And, and it's the same. What Donald Trump does is the same thing Hillary Clinton does. You know, when Hamas was raining rockets onto Israel and it was discovered that Hamas was keeping their missiles in schools, in elementary schools. Hillary Clinton gave an interview where she said, well, you got to understand, Gaza's really small, so they don't have any, any other place did, to put them. When did Trump say that? Trump, uh, that's Hillary Clinton. Yeah, but you said they're the same. Uh, they both accept the moral equivalence. They both refuse to acknowledge how they're different. You know, it was striking. Trump's speech, he repeatedly referred to Palestine, which was just very odd. Palestine hadn't existed since 1948. And it was clearly a speech where you know, one of the challenges with foreign policy is that Donald's knowledge of the world right. is very, very limited. At a CNN debate, you'll recall Hugh Hewitt asked him about the nuclear triad. All right, let, let's get back to the Middle East. We'll talk about the triad another time. Let's talk about the Middle East right now. You've said you want to move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Yes. And you would start the process on day one. Yes. You know that President Reagan said the same thing. He wants to move the embassy. Both President Bush's mm -hmm. said the same thing. When they took office, they didn't do it, right. citing security concerns. Why do you think you would be different? I will do what I said. We will move the embassy to Jerusalem. And you're right, Republicans and Democrats have said this for year after year after year. And it's actually U.S. law. 
you know, in every other country on earth, but our there, embassy. But there is a waiver in there. Every six months, the president right. of the United States can sign a waiver saying, I'm not doing it for national security. And, and what has happened is... And every president has done that. You are right. We have had presidents, both Democrats and Republicans, who have exercised their waiver. Today at AIPAC, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton before him both promised to move the embassy to Jerusalem. Everyone watching them knows if they get into the White House, they will exercise the waiver and they won't move it to Jerusalem. Indeed, Hillary's husband, Bill Clinton, that's what Bill Clinton did, is exercise the waiver. The difference is, when I say I'm going to do something, I do it. Irrespective of the consequences, the anger that it would generate, the security concerns it could cause, the uh, diplomatic repercussions from the rest of the Arab world. Well, the, the, the difference is, when I say it, I say it taking the consequences into account. So it's not just empty campaign rhetoric. But rather, on day one, beginning the process of moving the embassy to Jerusalem sends a message both to our friends and to our allies. To our friends, look, for seven years, the Obama administration hasn't stood with them. Right. Has abandoned, but, but let me explain this, Wolf, because this is important. We have been abandoning and alienating our friends and allies. Moving the embassy to Israel, to, to Jerusalem, makes a statement to every one of our allies that America is back. And it also makes a statement to the enemies, yes, many in the Arab world will be very upset. Iran will be furious at moving the embassy to Jerusalem. And it makes a statement to the radical Islamic terrorists who want to kill us that America will stand up to them again, that the era of appeasement under the Obama-Clinton right. foreign policy is over. Today, Donald Trump suggested that the U.S. should reconsider its role in NATO, diminish that role, stop spending all that money for NATO commitments. Do you agree? I, I don't. I found his remarks really quite, quite astonishing. Why? To, to suggest that he would voluntarily weaken NATO, either withdraw America from NATO or decrease our involvement from NATO. He didn't say withdraw, he said decrease. It, well, but he wasn't clear on the details, Let which the is... the NATO allies, for example, take care of Ukraine. He said Germany's got more of an interest there than the United States. Well, well, Donald, in all likelihood, has no awareness of this, but with regard to Ukraine, the United States has a deep involvement. Ukraine used to be the third largest nuclear country on the face of the earth. Ukraine voluntarily gave up its nuclear weapons because the United States of America came in and said, if you hand over those nuclear weapons, we will ensure your territorial integrity from Russia. We made a commitment. And then the Obama administration has broken its word. What nation on earth that has nukes would ever voluntarily give it up again? Now, everything I just said, I'll bet you dollars to donuts, Donald Trump has no idea about any of that. When he said, Ukraine's not our problem, he's not focusing on protecting ourselves against nuclear war. And it has been Russia's objective, it's been Putin's objective for decades to break NATO, he to says, break it he apart. He says it's a U.S. problem, but Germany and other NATO allies in but, Europe but, have but, a but, bit but, bigger but that, interest there than the United States that does. That is so And there's a lot of money that could be spent here as opposed to being spent over there. That is so hopelessly naive. And what Donald Trump is saying is that he would unilaterally surrender to Russia and Putin, give Putin a massive foreign policy victory by breaking NATO and abandoning Europe. That's going backwards. You know what? You know who would agree with that? Barack Obama. Trump's policy idea is entirely consistent with Obama withdrawing from Utah. You know, after the, after the Paris with, withdrawing attack. Withdrawing from where? Withdrawing from, from Europe, rather. You, you, you know, if you look at after the Paris attacks, when you saw leaders of the world right. marching with Paris and singularly absent was America. Obama wasn't there. Kerry wasn't there. Nobody was there. That reflects Obama's leading from behind. And, you know, Trump's foreign policy is the Obama-Hillary leading from behind. What he said is we need to withdraw from the whole world. This is a dangerous world. If America withdraws, we get the kind of chaos that Obama-Clinton has produced. Let's talk about your national security advisors. Mm -hmm. Last week, uh, you released a list of your foreign policy advisors. Frank Gaffney was on that mm -hmm. list, a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense during the Reagan administration. Uh, Mr. Gaffney uh, has said that President Obama is a Muslim, that the Muslim Brotherhood uh, placed operatives throughout the federal government, that Saddam Hussein probably was behind the Oklahoma City bombing, that Chris Christie may have been complicit in treason by appointing a Muslim American to New Jersey's state judiciary. Is this someone whose views you agree with? Well, look, I recognize that folks in the media get really nervous when you actually call out radical Islamic terrorism. Frank Gaffney is someone I respect. Frank Gaffney is a serious thinker who has been focused on fighting jihadism, fighting jihadism across the globe. And he's endured attacks from the left, from the media, because he speaks out against radical Islamic terrorism, because he speaks out against, for example, 
the political correctness of the Obama administration that effectively gets in bed with the Muslim so, Brotherhood. So the Muslim Brotherhood is a terrorist organization. Let's be precise. When he said back in 2009, Barack Hussein Obama would have to be considered America's first Muslim president. Do you agree with him on Listen, that? Listen, I don't know what he said in 2009. I and just I'm, read I'm, you the quote. I, I don't have the full context. I'm not interested in playing the media gotcha game of here's every quote every person who's supporting you has said at any point. Do you agree with every statement? That's silliness. Here's my view. We need a commander-in-chief that defends America. And defending America means defeating radical Islamic terrorism and defeating ISIS. What is completely unreasonable is Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton's consistent pattern of refusing even to say the words radical Islamic terrorism. When we see a terror attack, but let me finish this point, Wolf. When we see a terror attack in Paris, in San Bernardino, and President Obama says, gosh, I didn't realize people were upset. I guess I wasn't watching the cable news. And then he gives a national TV conference where he doesn't call out radical Islamic terrorists, but instead he lectures Americans on Islamophobia. We need a commander in chief keeping us safe. And one of the reasons why we're going to win in November is people are fed up with this silliness. Would he be considered your national security advisor if you were president? Look, Frank is one of a number of people who is part of the team who are advising me. And, and I appreciate his good counsel. For example, Frank, so Frank, has, been, Frank has been leading leading the effort to focus on the threat of an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse, which would be a nuclear weapon detonated in the atmosphere that would take down our electrical grid. It could, it could kill tens of millions of Americans. And all Iran would have to do is fire one nuke into the atmosphere. They don't need to hit anything. They just need to get it above the eastern seaboard. And they could kill tens of millions. That is valuable work focusing so, on national so security. He, and, and I'm curious, well, you know, when does... When does the media focus on threats like an EMP? I think we focused on a lot of those threats. But let me just read one other thing. He says, there's some pr pretty compelling circumstantial evidence of Saddam Hussein's Iraq being involved with the people who pen perpetrated the 1993 attack on the World Trade Center and even the Oklahoma City bombing. Now, you're a smart guy. Have you seen any circumstantial evidence to back that up? You know, I told you a minute ago, I'm not going to play the gotcha game of every quote every advisor may have given 20 years ago. You're, you're welcome to throw them out. That but, was in but, 2009. But I'm actually interested in talking about the problems in this country and, and not, th this is silliness. Right. And for, you know, let, let's focus on, on real problems face, facing America. Let's, let's talk about uh, Cuba. Great. Uh, President Obama's in Cuba right now. You're Cuban-American, as we all know. You've said you would shut down the U.S. Embassy in Cuba if you were elected president. Would you also terminate what U.S. businesses are now doing in Cuba immediately upon taking office? I would enforce the law, and, and, and federal law prohibits doing business with Cuba. And, and there's a reason for this. So to understand what Obama's doing in Cuba, you've got to put it in broader context. You know, today Obama is there in Cuba with movie stars and rock stars, and the far left has always glamorized the Castros in Cuba. They're chic, and, and you know, Che Guevara was, was such a good-looking young, young revolutionary. And my, now, mind you, he was a homicidal maniac who tortured and murdered people, but he looked good unshaven. And, you know, a, as Barack Obama is sitting there sipping mojitos with brutal communist dictators, he can't be bothered to meet the dissidents. He can't be bothered to visit with the ladies in white. He can't be bothered to hear the screams of oppression. And what Obama is doing in Cuba is actually very much the same as what he's doing in Iran. In Iran, he's giving over $100 billion to the Ayatollah Khamenei, the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism who chants death to America. In Cuba, he's giving billions of dollars to the Castros. Communist dictators so 90 one, miles... So would reverse all of that? I, we should be standing up to enemies of America, and we shouldn't give billions of dollars to people who hate us and want to kill us. This Cuban, is not... The Cuban people don't hate us. No, but he's not giving the money to the Cuban people. He's giving it to Fidel... But Fide the Cuban people will benefit from all this investment that's coming in. No, they won't. And, and, and this is... If you look at Cuba, every dollar that goes into Cuba goes to the government. And what this will do is it will strengthen the repressive regime of Fidel and Raul Castro. It will increase the tortures. It will increase the murders. And it will also increase Cuba spreading terrorism throughout Latin America and anti-Americanism. And as you know, my family has first-hand experience with this. Right. My dad was imprisoned and tortured by Batista in Cuba. And my aunt, my tia Sonia, was imprisoned and tortured by Castro's goons. And, you know, a couple of years ago, I, I had the privilege of meeting with Natan Sharansky, uh, the famed Soviet dissident. We met in Jerusalem. And, and Sharansky described how in the gulag, when Reagan was president, that they would pass from cell to cell notes. Did you hear what President Reagan said? Evil empire ash heap of history, tear down this wall. 
There is power to the president standing up and speaking the truth to evil. And what this president does is exactly the opposite. He abandons our friends and he shows weakness and appeasement. He gives billions of dollars to our enemies who hate us. It's exactly right. backwards. Let's talk about miracles. Okay. All right. Uh, you said today there was proof that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob still produced miracles. The proof, you said, is that Lindsey Graham <laughs> held a fundraiser for you here in Washington today. Uh, that's a pretty big miracle. Uh, it, it was a remarkable miracle. Just, just a few weeks ago, he was openly uh, c calling for my murder. So that's, that, that, that's a remarkable thing. Listen, I, li I like Lindsey personally. He's got a wonderful sense of humor. He's a passionate supporter of Israel. And Lindsey reflects he's part of what we're seeing more broadly across the country. We're seeing Republicans uniting behind this campaign, coming together. We're seeing Republicans, the full spectrum, from Lindsey Graham and Mitt Romney to Mike Lee and Mark Levin. Now, that is a broad spectrum across the full coalition of Republicans are uniting behind our campaign, because our, our campaign well, is the only campaign you don't that have... has repeatedly beaten and that can and will beat Donald Trump. Well, one Republican who's not on that list is the Republican presidential frontrunner right now, Donald Trump. Listen to what he has said about you over the weekend. Uh, he was born in Canada, lived there for four years. He was a citizen of Canada 15 or 16 months ago. He was a citizen of Canada. Can you believe it? He became a United States senator. And then he said, I didn't know I was a citizen of Canada. Lion Ted, Lion Ted. He didn't know. Lion Ted, Lion Ted. One of the, the biggest liars I've ever seen in my life. I really mean it. You know, and he walks in, you know, the evangelicals are with me because they know one thing about me. I'm not a liar. But, but Ted Cruz, he walks in Bible high, Bible high, puts it down, and he starts lying. I'll tell you what. All right, your response. Oh, listen, you know, every time Donald gets scared, he begins lashing out. He begins attacking. He begins insulting. He begins yelling. Often he begins cursing. I'm impressed Donald managed not to curse in that particular riff, but give him a minute. He, that, that, that'll change. And, you know, I will say this. Donald's campaign, his entire campaign is built on a lie. I understand the people who are supporting what's, what's Donald. What's the lie? Well, let me explain. I, I understand the people who are supporting Donald. They're frustrated with Washington, with politicians in both parties that have been lying to us, that make promises. And they go to Washington and they do the exact opposite of what they said. But if you're fed up with Washington, with the corruption of Washington, then it doesn't make any sense to support Donald Trump, who has been enmeshed in the corruption of Washington. The lie behind Donald's campaign is that he will stand up to Washington. He, he is the system. Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are flip sides of the same coin. Donald Trump has made billions buying influence in Washington. Hillary Clinton has made millions selling influence in Washington. And Donald Trump has supported liberal Democratic politicians for 40 years, from Jimmy Carter to John Kerry to Joe Biden to Chuck Schumer to Harry Reid to Hillary Clinton as a presidential campaign. And Donald Trump has enriched himself using government power. And in every instance, Donald believes government is the solution, whether it was supporting the Wall Street bailout, which he did. He supported Obama's bailout, supporting the Obama stimulus plan, or using eminent domain to take the homes of little old ladies, or to try to do so, so it, in order to build a parking lot for his casino. It's interesting, because even though he calls you Lion Ted, yeah. you've heard it many times, just heard it right there, uh, I asked him if he might consider you as his vice presidential running mate if he gets the mm -hmm. Republican nomination, and he said, crazier things happen in politics. Here's the question. Are you open to being his vice presidential running mate? I have zero interest whatsoever in this. And, and listen... If Donald Trump is the nominee, it's a disaster. Hillary wins. Donald may be the only candidate on the face of the planet that Hillary Clinton can beat in a general election. And the stakes are too high. If you're fed up with illegal immigration, Donald Trump funded the Gang of Eight that pushed the massive amnesty plan. I led the opposition to it. If you're fed up with wages being driven down by illegal immigration. Donald Trump has supported open border Democrats for 40 years. And if you are unhappy with the economic stagnation, with the job loss caused by Obamacare, Donald Trump funded Harry Reid and Nancy so Pelosi taking over the Congress, which led directly to Obamacare. So far, about half of the states have voted in Republican yeah. primaries and caucuses. He has two million more votes than you have. The people have spoken. 
Uh, the people have spoken, and what they have said, we started with 17 candidates. It was a wonderful, it was a diverse, talented, young, dynamic field. It's now narrowed. This is effectively a two-person race. There are only two candidates with any plausible path to winning the nomination and getting 1,237 delegates. If he, doesn't, if he doesn't get that exact number, but gets close and you're much further behind and he has billions more votes, you think he should get the nomination? Well, let's be clear. My objective is to win 1,237 Let's say you delegates. don't. And let's say he doesn't, but he's closer than you are. Well, and he has millions more I, look, votes. I think the hypothetical you're giving is totally fanciful, and it's not going to happen. They're one of two scenarios. Number one, I believe we're going to win 1,237 delegates and win the nomination before the convention. The second outcome that is far more likely is nobody gets to 1237 and we go into the convention with Donald having a bunch of delegates and me having a bunch of delegates and we're going to be neck and neck. And if that happens, then the convention is going to decide. Now, they're not going to do what, what people in the fevered swamps of Washington want, which is bring in a white horse who wasn't on the ballot, who wasn't running. That's not going to happen. The delegates are going to decide between Donald and me. And if we go in with a bunch of delegates each, I believe we win that, and we win let that me, by earning the support of the delegates elected through the Democratic Party. Let process. me get your reaction to a political a Politico report uh, saying your campaign, that would be the Cruz campaign, is exploring the possibility of forming a unity ticket with Marco Rubio. You're smiling, you're laughing, uh, that you, you had considered that possibility. Listen, pe people write all sorts of things in the media. Is it true? Um, I haven't had any conversation with Marco about that. Th that is not accurate. Our staff hasn't had any, had any conversation with Marco's staff. It is true that a lot of people have suggested uh, that, that, that Marco and I should join forces. And I think very, very highly of Marco. Marco is a friend. He's talented. He's an incredible communicator. Uh, and he inspired millions in this campaign. And what we are seeing right now is the overwhelming majority of the Rubio supporters are coming to support us. So it sounds us. like you think that could be a good idea to team up with him. Listen, we welcome Marco's supporters with open arms, and I would enthusiastically welcome Marco's support. I think very, very highly of him. Uh, but what we're seeing, that is a manifestation. And by the way, I'd enthusiastically welcome John Kasich's support. We are seeing Republicans come together, 65 to 70 percent of Republicans recognize that Donald Trump would be a disaster, that he loses to Hillary. And if Hillary wins, we lose the Supreme Court for a generation, we lose the Bill of Rights, and our kids are buried in trillions more Very dead. quick, yes or no. If Trump is the nominee, will you support him? Uh, I have said many times, yes. That's a commitment I made. And as we started on moving the embassy to Jerusalem, when I say I'm going to do something, I do exactly what I said. But let me be clear. Trump is not going to be the nominee because that hands the general election to Hillary. We're going to beat Trump, and what we are seeing... Our campaign's the only one that has beaten him now nine times all over the country, and we're seeing Republicans come together and unite, and we're going to keep on winning primaries and caucuses going forward, including, I hope we do very well, in Utah and Arizona coming up tomorrow. Senator, thank you very much. Thank you. God bless.